comfortable place, but you'll have to uh, find something outside of the building <laughs> if necessity requires it. So, let's pray together and attend to the preaching of God's Word. Our God and our Father, we are so thankful for your mercies to us. Uh, Lord, we, we, we confess that you are a God who rules and governs everything from the least to the greatest, uh, even the inconvenience of losing our, our modern um, systems and abilities. We, we count it um, a joy uh, to, to suffer for your sake. We count it a joy that you've given to us such manifold gifts, and we pray that our hearts would not grumble. We would not complain before you. Uh, we pray that you would lift our hearts to praise you instead, that we would give our careful attention both to the preaching and to the hearing of your word. We pray that Christ would be exalted and magnified, that his name would be praised because it is worthy of praise. And we pray that all of us as your people would be conformed more and more to the image of our Savior. May our hearts desire holiness before you. May our hearts desire uh, to be, have a foretaste of heaven uh, as we eagerly await for our Savior's return. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you will, take your seat and turn with me to the book of Judges. The book of Judges. We're going to begin a new series today. I anticipate that we'll be in Judges um, about six to eight months. You're, you're free to, to chuckle at that and, and think, well, that's, he's so cute, he never holds to his, his timelines, and that's fair enough. Today, our task is I want to look at some of the key themes of the book of Judges I'm going, to give, I'm going to wait till next week to give some of the historical background and setting. Uh, that, that will be important as we go through. But when I begin a new series, one of the things that is important, I think, for us to ask are why questions. Why? Partly, why, why is the book of Judges in the Bible? Because as you know, as you've read through the book of Judges, there are shocking events recorded here for us. Why is this here? In fact, why, not only why is it here, but why did God have to give us every detail like he did? Some of it's hard to read, isn't it? Some of it's even uncomfortable to have your children sitting next to you as, as some of these things are read and declared. Why? Why is it here? And then also, of all the books in the Bible, why are you preaching judges? I mean, because of that, couldn't you have picked something else, something a little milder? Well, to kind of start with the second question first, one of the, the convictions that, that I have pastorally and a conviction that comes from the Scriptures is that I'm to preach the whole counsel of God. So all of the Scriptures are profitable for us, and not only profitable for us to study privately as adults, but to be publicly proclaimed and heralded. That is a conviction. It's, it, it is the truth revealed to us from Scripture that all Scripture is profitable. That may be, at this point, a matter of faith for you to trust me on that, to trust the Lord on that, it may be something for which you've already, thankfully, been persuaded yourself, that, it, that everything must be declared and proclaimed because it is all God's word. But also because is, is I want to seek out a, maybe I call it a balanced diet. We've been in the New Testament for quite some time, preaching through Philippians and then Colossians. And now I want to, and some, with some Psalms in between, now I want us to spend some time in the Old Testament. It's going to exercise some different theological muscles. When we encounter Old Testament narrative, this is a different genre. The Bible's given to us in all different genres. We have poetry, we have Old Testament history books, narrative, we have didactic, instructive kind of teaching that we find in the epistles. We find um, apocalyptic literature and prophetic literature, all different kinds. God speaks to us in many ways through his word. Judges is going to require us to think a little differently. When you read a Pauline epistle, for example, sometimes it's just it's very clear what he's saying. It's organized. The point's very clear. He spells it out for you. It's almost like it's in all caps and a, and a bright font. You get to a book like the Judges and you go, oh my goodness, what is the point? What, what is it that I'm supposed to take away from this? What is the doctrinal truth that's here? So I want to paint some broad strokes today and give to us some themes so one of the things that we, that we encounter when we, when we read through Hebrew writing, and particularly the scriptures in the narrative text, is they are, the writers are not as concerned as we are in the West. We are very time-focused kinds of people, right? 
We want to start on time, or at least I do. We want to start on time. We want to have things organized chronologically in a linear way. The Hebrew mind, the ancient Eastern mind, didn't think quite that way. Things were organized more thematically. We're going to find in Judges. It's not a strict chronology to go through that. It is a, it is a, a book of history. Things happen literally as they're described here. But we shouldn't take it in such a wooden way that we read everything consecutive as if there's no overlap in the timing. And even in the first two chapters, it's clear. In verse 1, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites? And we'll see next week, here's a whole description of some of that conquest. Then we go to chapter 2, Joshua's still alive. So we know it's not strictly chronological. So we're going to look at some of the key themes. But as to the reason why this book is in the Bible and why some of the events are recorded at all and recorded in the ways that they are, I hope will be clearer after the today's sermon. Some of the themes that are addressed here to us come to us in the form of story. And you know, if you've worked with young children, sometimes to give them a story makes it more memorable, makes the point clearer. We can go to some of the New Testament epistles and read about the doctrines contained in the scriptures, and we can learn very precisely doctrinal truths that God is teaching to his people. But then we can leave and we might forget them. But some of the stories that we'll find in Judges, you won't forget. In fact, if, it, if the image is captured in your mind's eye, you won't be able to scrub that out. They're memorable. So God gives to us stories, and sometimes the reason that he presents himself in story form, and again, these are not just fairy tales, these are not, these are not fables, they are they're literal historical events, but they're grandiose. They're over the top in some cases, in order to illustrate some theological points, both for the people who originally experienced them, but also for us today. So I'm going to read, I'm going to go back and read again chapter 1 and verse 1, and we'll skip over and read chapter 2, 1 through 10. The title of today's sermon is The Snare of Unbroken Altars, and that language comes approximately out of chapter 2. What's happened is the people of Israel were commanded to go in and wipe out the inhabitants of the land, primarily the Canaanites, and they didn't do it. And it becomes a snare to them for the rest of the national life of Israel. In verse 1 of chapter 1, we read as following. Here is the word of God. After the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So we have the scene. This, this, this period in time happens long after, or not long after, but after the Exodus, the people of God were miraculously raised up, delivered out of the, the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their disobedience. Then God raised up Joshua to be the one actually to take them into the promised land. You remember, Moses was allowed to stand on the mountain and look into the promised land, but not actually enter in because of his own disobedience. Now, Joshua has led them into a conquest. That's the previous book, just, prior, just immediately prior to Judges. We see that, that history of the conquest of the various, each of the 12 tribes taking their allotted portion. But then chapter 2 picks up in this, in this way. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall, you shall break down their altars but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you've done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, 
and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Heres, and in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gaash. And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I want to present to you five major themes, five themes that we'll uncover in the book of Judges. You know, the key problem that that manifests itself from beginning to end in Judges presents itself early on in the very first few chapters. And the key problem described here in these opening pages of Judges is not, it, it is moral, it's not military. The problem is not weakness, but worship. So in other words, it wasn't that the people, we're going to see, it wasn't the people were unable to drive out their enemies, it's that they did not. The problem is not that they were unable to accomplish what God had put before them, it's that they refused to do it. And we could certainly turn to the New Testament and and get a a full theological treatment of of sin and its effects. But what we're going to find in Judges, the very first theme is the sinfulness of sin. The sinfulness of sin. Judges pulls no punches. It holds nothing back, showing us how vile and wicked and and dark sin is. And how what seems to be initially maybe a small root of sin flourishes and grows into a monstrosity. And again, we can turn to the New Testament and we can get a a full theological treatment of sin and depravity. And we ought to study those doctrines. We ought to study them very carefully because it's there in the New Testament that we get those things precisely given to us in a very clear and orderly way. So, for example, we could turn to Romans chapter 3. And you don't have to turn here. Just, just listen to this. We'll read a couple verses. We, we can get a sense from Paul of the theology of depravity. So we can read in Romans, 9, or Romans 3 verse 9, for example, what then? Are we better? Not at all. He's comparing Jews and Gentiles. He says, we, Jews, have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under the law. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And we can study that, and we might even have a theological debate with someone on on, on Facebook about the nature of depravity and, and Calvinism, and is man totally depraved or is he partially good? We could read that, and we should. We should study it. We, should, we could talk deeply about it. But the book of Judges gives us a vivid account of how utterly depraved men, man is from the womb. Even among God's people. I mean, Judges teaches us that in the end, it's not, the, it's not only the Canaanites that are sinful to the core. Even God's people have a sin problem. I heard a quote this week from from Mark Dever. He says, people naturally respond to God's blessings with sin. You ever notice that? In you and in others, people naturally respond to God's blessings with sin. Isn't that perverse? But that's the point. That's the point of Judges. Is One of the key themes is the sinfulness of sin. You know, we think about Gideon. Gideon was a hero to Israel. He was a conquering hero. And yet his idolatrous heart produced an ephod which was, which was a, a, an augment to his worship. And the narrator tells us, and all Israel whored after it, the ephod there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. Here's the mighty Gideon. The one we look up to, this is, if there's a hero in Judges, surely it's Gideon. I know he's a sinful man. He has an idolatrous heart. How can we read Judges and forget the pride, the dishonoring of parents, and the lust of Samson? See, again, we can read Romans chapter 3 and, and academically think about depravity. Then we go to Gideon, we go to Samson, we go to the other judges, and we see it in real life. Then by the end of the book, and we see that the depravity in Israel is on a scale that's hardly distinguishable from their Canaanite neighbors. I mean, for example, a traveler, a male traveler, is, is unsafe to stay outside in the hill country of Ephraim because of sodomite bandits that roamed through. That's how wicked it had become. And that's followed by the unspeakably brutal treatment of a concubine. In graphic terms. We can't read through Judges and say, well, I don't know if men's really wicked or not, can we? 
I mean, we can debate somebody over Romans 3, but come on now. We can't read Judges and say, well, man's basically good. There's some goodness in him. This needs to be cultivated. No, we can't come to that conclusion. See, quoting Isaiah and the Psalms, again in Romans 3, Paul says, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, in the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know. We know that what Paul says is true. I mean, academically, we know that's true. But we might be tempted to ignore that or downplay it or even debate it. But when we read the account of a woman being abused all night long and then hearing how her master cut her to 12 pieces and sent her around the countryside, can we deny depravity? Can we forget that? We are suddenly and disturbingly shocked in such a way that we simply cannot forget how sinful sin is. There's a repeated refrain in Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And, and what we find then is it's not that everyone did what was right in his pure and undefiled eyes. Everyone did what was right in his own wicked, defiled eyes, which of course is a metaphor for his whole person, his own judgment, his perspective, his wisdom, all of it had been tainted by sin. And we see the gross effects of that everywhere in the book of Judges. I mean, how can we forget... And we think about, well, if somebody's, I get that, that, that temp, men are tempted to do horrible things, but just ordinary course of life, surely the righteous people will always make good decisions, right? Especially ones that have the Spirit of God, they will always make good decisions. What about Jephthah? He made a foolish, rash vow, ended up sacrificing his own daughter. Just a few verses after the text tells us he was filled with the Spirit of God. See, sin remains, and sin causes problems, even for God's people. Depravity and sin affects everything. And Judges gives us graphic examples of both the breadth and the depth of sin. So that's theme number one we're going to see over and over and over again, is the sinfulness of sin. So as you're reading through Judges on your own, think about that. Contemplate as you're tempted, you know, as we sing together, ye who think of sin but lightly, or suppose the evil great, see and estimate rightly. See, you can read through the book of Judges and be reminded your sin can't be trifled with. Your sin can't be played with. It's not a toy. It's not something to be taken lightly. Theme number two. It's related. Because sinfulness, we see the sinfulness of sin, but we also see the helplessness of sinners to deliver themselves. One of the things we're going to see over and over again is how utterly helpless the people of God are. They have huge problems as a consequence of their sin, and they can't do anything about it. The only thing they can do is cry out to God. The only thing they do is cry out to God, which, thanks be to God, that is enough. So again, these unforgettable stories preserved for us in the book of Judges makes this truth abundantly clear, that sinners have no recourse in themselves. Brothers and sisters, you can't fix your problems. You can't fix yourself. You can't deal with the sin that remains in you. You can't solve the problem. And over and over again, the people of God rebel. We see that, that that's his pattern, and God gives them over to their enemies, and the people have absolutely no way to rescue themselves. I mean, think about what Midian was up against, and what the people of God were, were up against, against uh, Gideon, against the Midianites. In Judges chapter 6, the Midianites would camp against them. I mean, the people of God were hiding out in caves. That they, they were, I mean, literally afraid to come above ground, especially when it was harvest season. They would hide while threshing their wheat because they knew that as soon as the Midianites got wind that their crops were in, here they would come and destroy everything. Listen to this. The Midianites would camp against them and ruin the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would go up with their livestock in their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable. And they came into the land to make it a ruin. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel cried out to Yahweh. And then in verse, or chapter 7, Now the Midianites and the Malachites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as numerous as the sand on the seashore. 
It's overwhelming odds. And, and it is a, is a graphic picture in, in historical form of a spiritual reality. There's a problem of sin that can, and nothing can be done. Nothing can be done by the Israelites to save themselves. I mean, who could deliver Israel from the hands of the mighty Philistines except Yahweh? Even the mighty Samson, as it turns out, couldn't do that on his own. Even the mighty Samson found himself, in the end, weak, bound, and blind. And you know how the story of Samson's life ends, don't you? The lords of the Philistines assembled. They had taken Samson captive. They assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to be glad. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Then the people saw him and praised their God, for they said, our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. And the story ends. Samson called to Yahweh and said, oh, Lord Yahweh, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. O oh God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two pillars on which the house was established and supported himself against them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with his strength so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he put to death by his death were more than those whom he had put to death in his life. Here's the mighty Samson in the end, helpless, hopeless. All he could do was cry out to the Lord. If you've walked with Christ any, any amount of time at all, you know this experientially, don't you? You know, maybe as a new believer, you were like, like me, and you, you kind of foolishly thought, oh, okay, I've made some good progress right away. I mean, I, I've, I've cleaned up my language, I've done this, I've done that, I, I, I can, I'm really making some good progress here. And then you realize how helpless you are. You realize how hopeless you are in the war against your flesh if the Lord does not help you, if his spirit does not give you strength. And with the theological force that only real stories can impart, the book of Judges makes plain to us that God alone, God alone is our deliverer. Man cannot save himself. And, and Judges leaves us longing for a sinless deliverer who will come and make all things new. He leaves us longing for that. So that's theme number two is the utter helplessness of man against his own sin. So the sinfulness of sin, the helplessness of man against that sin. Thirdly, the third theme we see, and this again pervades the entire book, is the polluting effect of false worship. The polluting effect of false worship. You might refer to this, and I've seen commentators refer to this as the canonization of Israel. We see in our text, in chapter 2, look at back at verse 11, this is just following what I read. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. Now, something very similar to that phrase comes up again and again and again and again. Remember, this was, this was not... This was a moral problem, not a military problem. This was a worship problem. This was the primary recurring sin of God's people. It was their idolatry. And essentially, and fundamentally, worship was the root issue. And there, there's a couple of things, two things in particular, we need to understand about their idolatry. Number one is that the Israelites rarely abandoned the worship of Yahweh outright. It wasn't as if they had worshipped Yahweh and then they chose to worship Baal instead of Yahweh. They tried to blend them together. We could use the word syncretism, trying to blend these things together. They didn't cease worshipping God, but rather they would add to that the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth. And here, here's a striking example of this. In chapter 16, in the account of Micah, there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse and spoke of it in my hearing, behold, the silver is with me. It was I who took it. 
And his mother said, Blessed be my son by Yahweh. And he then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I wholly set apart the silver from my hand as holy to Yahweh for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. So now I will return them to you. So, she, so he returned the silver to his mother, and his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave them to the silversmith, and he made them into a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and household idols and ordained one of his sons, and he became a, his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Do you see this? Praise be to Yahweh. My silver has been found. My son has repented. Now let's make a graven image. And it wasn't, let's make a graven image and we'll worship some other god. We want to worship Yahweh, but we want to do it in our way, on our terms. And and here's a a tragedy. We can follow this this through when you get to to the end of chapter 18. We're told that the very grandson of Moses, a man by the name of Jonathan, led all the city of Dan to worship graven images using these very idols, this very idol that Micah had made, or Micah's mother had made. Judges teaches us, once again, with, with an urgency of a true life story, how easily we can slip into blending of the worship of Yahweh with the things of this world. And how easily our idolaters' hearts will seek to blend things together. And it's, you know, if you were to sit there, if, if, if you kind of interjected in this narrative with Micah and his mom and said, hey, wait a minute, didn't, didn't, didn't God say something about not making graven images? How do you think they would respond? Well, we're just being sincere. We, we just want to worship God more fervently. So this is a help to us. It just reminds us, we're going to put it here on the mantle, and it just reminds us to worship God. But didn't God say not to do it? Well, yeah, but in this case, it's fine because it's, it's, it helps us in our devotion. You see how the reasoning goes. And if we think that we're not prone to that, we don't know ourselves, do we? We don't know the, de- the, de- the, the seductive nature of false worship. But there's a second thing about this worship problem that we need to understand, especially in the context of Canaan. We need to understand a little bit about the allure and the particular attraction of the Canaanite religion. See, the God of the Bible is presented, from Genesis 1 on, is presented to us as unique. He is outside of his creation. Our God is self-existent. We could use the term aseity. He is self-existent. He requires nothing from his creatures. He requires nothing from his creation. He is self-existent. He sits enthroned in heaven, and he rules and governs all things. He makes all things. He rules all things. He governs all things. He is outside of his creation. But for the Canaanites and for all pagan religions, that is not so. For the Canaanites, Baal was their chief god, but he was made essentially in their image. He was better than them, higher than them, but he was still like them, including his sexual lusts. See, Baal was the god of the storm and the god of fertility. And the Canaanites believed that Baal was responsible for the fruitfulness of their fields, of their livestock, and their families. But here's what's fascinating. In their minds, in their beliefs, how this fruitfulness came about is that their god, Baal, had a divine lover, a divine consort, named uh, Ashtoreth or Ashtart. And the Canaanites believed that by their own ritual prostitution and sexual perversions, they were essentially compelling Baal to have sexual relations with his consort so that that would produce a fruitfulness in their fields and in their barns and in their homes. Well, that sounds silly to us, but this was, this was what they believed about how the world worked. That their God, number one, unlike Yahweh, their God had to be provoked to do something. So you remember when Elisha called out and he taunted them. The prophets of Baal, remember? Is your God asleep? Is he in the bathroom? What's happening here? And they're cutting themselves, they're bleeding, they're chanting, all these kinds of things, trying to get Baal to act. It's because they believed that their God was really just a higher version of them and that he was responsible by, for his, by his own procreative acts. He was responsible for their procreative abilities. 
listen to Ralph Davis describing this. He said, if we turn on our imagination lights, we can readily understand how the Israelites would be lured toward Baal worship by the Canaanites they had allowed to remain in the land. One can almost hear a helpful Canaanite trying to talk a little religion and sense to his Israel neighbor. Oh, yes, having Yahweh who brings you out of Egypt, who makes Pharaoh cry uncle, who divides the Jordan, all that's fine. And I've got nothing against this Yahweh, mind you. But here in Canaan, it's not always the Big Bang that matters, but getting into the rhythms of nature. I mean, trying to manage the day-to-day situation with crops and flocks and so forth, naturally. I might be able to help you know some of our secrets. Maybe. Maybe you and your son would like to come with me to the high place for our midweek service. See, there's a seductive nature to this. And this is true today with all false religions. There's something that appeals to our flesh. There's something that says, oh, I'm not just passively waiting upon the grace of God to come. I might be able to do something to provoke God to act. I might be able to manipulate heaven in some way. See how seductive this is? Does this sound familiar? See, the worship of the true and living God mixed with the little worship of nature and its processes? Does any of that sound familiar? Does a ring have a, have a ring of familiarity? The book of Judges does not merely tell us about the attraction of false worship. It shows us. There's a, there's a mantra in, in the world of writing, especially in the writing of, of fiction and stories. It's the idea of you, you show, don't tell is good writing. You don't have to tell everything. The narrator doesn't have to tell everything. Show it. It's more compelling. It's more memorable. Well, the book of Judges does this. It shows us sometimes more than it tells us. It gives us these memorable examples of how destructive and seductive this false worship is. It reminds us that we must always, constantly, unceasingly, prayerfully, make it our aim to guard the true worship of God. This is not an area of compromise, saints. This is why we hold so firmly to what's known as the regulative principle. We we go to the scriptures. What are we to do in worship? Okay, that's what we do. So our order of worship is, is, is really simple for that reason. Not because we're wise, because we're perfect. It's actually the opposite. It's because we're not wise, we're not perfect. We need our instructions explicitly given to us from our king and our redeemer, our mediator. We need a mediator to stand between us and God most high. So that's the third theme is the seductive nature of false worship and, and how it just... It's like red dye in a glass of water. It just goes everywhere. It's the fourth theme we want to consider together. The fourth theme is this, the futility of outward transformation. Pardon me, my allergies have got me super dry. The futility of outward transformation one of the things we, we read over and over again in, in Judges, because of the cyclical nature of things, I've heard Judges described as circular in the way that it presents the people of God walking in prosperity and peace. And then they give their hearts over to idolatry. And they provoke the anger of the Lord, and then God delivers them into the hands of their adversaries, and they're oppressed, and they suffer, and they cry out to God, and God in his mercy delivers them. And there, it is true, there is a circular nature to that. But as long as we understand that circle is not just staying in a circle, it's going down. It's the circle of a whirlpool. It's the circle of a descent. It's the circle of a downward spiral. And by the time we get to the end of Judges, you realize how far into the pit of sin and misery the people have gone. And what we find out is every time God delivers them, they make promises to themselves, Lord, we're going to be better. We're going to do better. We're going to work harder. We're going to be more holy. And they seek to transform their lives. They, 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 they seek to, to reform their behavior. They seek moral reformation. And what we find out, the book of Judges, again, illustrates to us powerfully the futility of outward transformation. The, the futility of merely reforming ourselves morally. We need an inward transformation. This is because the root cause of sin in the people of Israel was never addressed by the law. But, but we, we know that. The law wasn't designed. The 
law was not designed by God to address the inward problem of sin. It was to give us, to show us our need for a redeemer, to show us our need for God's mercy and deliverance. And it's to show us, those of us who are believers, to show us what righteousness looks like, but it was never designed to give us an inward transformation. In fact, many years later, uh, Yahweh would speak to the people of God through Jeremiah the prophet, and he would promise them that there was a covenant coming, a new kind of covenant, a covenant that would provide an inside-out transformation. Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I cut with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, but I was a husband to them. See, remember in Judges chapter 2, Yahweh says, I'll never break this covenant with you. But the people of God broke it. They broke it again and again and again. And Yahweh says through Jeremiah, I'm going to make a new covenant, one that's not like that old one. The old one was, was, was a promise of death upon your disobedience. Listen to the terms of the new covenant. This is the covenant which I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God and they shall be my people, and they will not teach again each man to his neighbor and each man to his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. See, this is a covenant unlike the old covenant that God made with, with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai mediated through Moses. This is a different kind of covenant altogether, a covenant of grace by which a heart of stone is replaced with a heart of flesh, by which we are born again into a new and living way. We are made new creatures. We have new desires, new affections, new abilities. None of those things were, were a, a piece or a, an immediate product of the old covenant. I'm not saying that regeneration and rebirth didn't happen. Everyone who was, who was born of God who was a, a true child of Abraham by faith, was regenerated. But that was not based on the terms of the covenant of works. That was not based on the, the Sinaitic covenant. That was based on the promise given to Abraham, renewed with Moses, that one day there will be a new kind of covenant altogether. And it is by the grace of this new covenant that we are transformed. If you'll turn with me over to Titus. Ti Paul, in his letter to Titus, illustrates this wonderfully. In Titus chapter 2, See, the situation in which Paul writes to Titus here, it, it, it's a mess. And Paul says, this is why I've left you in Crete, because things are disordered. And, and you need to appoint elders in every town, because there are, there are false teachers on every corner. And Paul even talks about the culture there in Crete. He says, the Cretans, a prophet of their own, says Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul says, that's true. That's a true testimony. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. Verse 16, they profess, these false teachers profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Tell us what you really think about these people, Paul. But look what happens in Titus 2. But as for you, here's the contrast. You are the true teacher. You are the, the true ambassador for Christ. You teach what accords with, what is fitting with, what is suitable to sound doctrine. And then he looks, as it were, at all four corners of the congregation. Older men, older women. Younger men and younger women. Slaves and masters. He says, all of you ought to bear fruit that's consistent with the doctrine that you've heard. Now look what he does in verse 11. All this is true, and then he says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, 
the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Here it is, Titus. Here's, here's the key. It is not external reformation. It is not external change that you are seeking. It is the grace of God working from the inside out. It is the grace of God working on the, by the indwelling Spirit's power that trains us, trains us to renounce ungodliness. You read the judges, you go, wow, those people could have used that. So can we. This grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Judges reminds us that moral reformation just won't do. Trying to clean ourselves up isn't going to work. We need the grace of God working from within. The grace of regeneration, the work of the Holy Spirit, leads to lasting change. And, and Judges teaches us, and again, once again, we have this sort of high-definition impact of stories of Israel's steady, constant moral decline. It teaches us that outward transformation is futile. I mean, moral reformation isn't enough. All their vows, all their covenanting, all their promises to God, all their promises to themselves and to one another didn't keep them from devolving further and further and further into the snares and cords of sin. And it won't do it for us either. Apart from the grace of God working in us, our own rededications and repurposing ourselves and, and, and vows and affirmations and, and all those kinds of things are, are useless. We saw that in Colossians, didn't we? You have this appearance of godliness, but is of no value in stopping the indulgences of the flesh. This whole idea of taste not, touch not, that's what I'll do. I'll just avoid everything, and then I'll be holy. We've still got an inside problem. I've still got an inside problem. And surely you know this is true. How successful have your efforts been to tame your tongue? I, I'm, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm not going to speak like that ever again. How'd that work? I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guard my eyes from now on. I will never. How'd that work? How, how effective have your efforts been to make yourself more honest? To make yourself more sincere? Be, be a better keeper of your promises and your obligations? I mean, kids, how successful have you been at just saying, I'm going to be better at, at obeying my parents. I'm just going to do better at that and honoring them. See, Judges leaves us longing for the rescue of sinners by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. God alone, God alone can transfer and rescue sinners by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. He alone can transfer us from the kingdom of darkness and transfer us into the kingdom of his own beloved son. God alone can create that inward desire to say with David, the, the, I delight in the law in my inner being. Only God can do that. Now let's, let's think about one more theme in the book of Judges. Save the best for last. Another theme in the book of Judges is the goodness of God. In the midst of all this mess in Judges, I mean, it, 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 it's just a complete horror show in many ways. And the light of God's grace shines through. The light of God's goodness shines through. His steadfastness, his faithfulness, his long-suffering, his wise providential rule over all things, it, it shines through. In Judges chapter 3, as we turn back to the, to the book of Judges, in Judges 3, in verse 8, the sons of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. Then the sons of Israel cried to Yahweh, and Yahweh raised up a Savior for the sons of Israel to save them. Othniel, 
the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, and the spirit of Yahweh came upon him, and he judged Israel, and he went out to war, and Yahweh gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. So his hand was strong against Cushan Rishathaim, and the land was quiet for 40 years. Why did God do this? Mercy. It was God's grace. It wasn't because the people deserved it. Again, we see this in chapter 3 later on, the very same chapter. Then again, the people had, had rebelled against God, and now they're under the rule of Moab, a terrible, horrible king. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. Favorite story of every little boy. And don't we see that pattern throughout Judges over and over and over again? The people of God in their misery, they cry out to him. And he hears them. And he delivers them. And he gives them peace. The people suffer under their oppressors and they call out to God. They suffer the weight and the misery of their own sin. And they call out to God and he rescues them. They did not merit this rescue. They did not deserve that rescue. And yet he delivers them again and again and again. Saints, this is the character of your God. And God has not changed. There is no variation or shadow due to change in our God. His goodness is, is uncompromised. His goodness is perfect. He is perfect goodness. But you know... I think the greatest display of God's covenant love during the time of the Judges is not even recorded in the book of Judges. Did you know that? Turn to the very end of Judges. Very end. Very last chapter. Now turn one more page. Ruth chapter 1, in the days when the Judges ruled. There was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. And he goes on to describe all three of these women lost their husbands. They were destitute in a foreign land. They were outside of God's covenant land, outside of the covenant promises. They were helpless, hopeless widows in a foreign land. And turn to the end of Ruth. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth. And she became his wife. And he went into her. And the Lord, the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer. It's not left you. It's not abandoned you. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, of the tribe of Judah, from whom God had promised his scepter would never depart. You see how faithful God is? This happens. This is like a little vignette that happens in this same time with the judges. So it can look like God has abandoned everything. And he's just sort of kind of coming in from time to time and putting things back up right again, but he's essentially just left them on their own. That is not true. God is overseeing every detail all the way down to these three dear ladies in a foreign land, and God cares for the widow. God cares for the helpless. God is so very good. The goodness of God, though, we have to understand, is demonstrated not only in the deliverance of his people, but we have to train ourselves to see 
that his goodness is also displayed in the use of their enemies to purify them. See, the chastening of a righteous father is a good thing, is it not? The writer of Hebrews tells us this. Discipline is, is profitable for us. It doesn't seem like that at the time, does it? It doesn't feel good. But it brings forth fruit. So over and over again, we see this. <laughs> Back to to Judges chapter 3. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, God, sold them into the hand of Cush and Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people served Cush and Rishathaim eight years. This was God's action. This wasn't God merely being passive and saying, well... You know, they made a deal with the Canaanites, it went bad, and they get what they deserve. No, this was God actively selling them into their enemies' hands. Why? For their good. Because God was concerned for their souls. Again, in Judges chapter 3, verse 12, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, he gathered to himself the Ammonites, and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. For their good. For their profit. For their eternal blessing. See, we naturally think of the goodness of God being displayed in his deliverance, in his rescue, right? I mean, that comes naturally to us. God's really blessing me. God's really blessing me because things are going well. We have to train ourselves to think when things are going badly. You know, God is really good. He is blessing me here. I don't have the eyes to see it. My faith is weak. My, my, my perspective is limited because of my finite mind and my finite perspective. I'm not the one who sees all and knows all and hears all and governs all. That is God. I train myself, I discipline myself on the authority of his word to believe that God is doing good things in me and for me and around me when things are hard. Even in what we might think of as as a worst case situation. I mean, think back to, we see this in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In the New Testament, one of the, the hardest chapters to read. You have a man who's in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother. And Paul gives this instruction. He says, deliver such a one to Satan. It means put him out of the assembly. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be served, saved in the day of the Lord. Even this was God's grace. And we see in 2 Corinthians. But apparently this man had repented. And Paul urged the congregation to restore this man to his full membership in the, in the body of Christ. See, we've got to train ourselves to think differently than our flesh will naturally think. We will naturally think, things are going well, God must be blessing me. God must be pleased with me. And it might be the case. And when things are not going well, God is chastening you. He is training you. He is refining you. He is shaping you more and more into the image of his Savior. Know how he does that? He takes stuff away. He removes things from you. He removes things from me. He's not adding on to us to purify us. That's not what purification is. Purification is removal. In our confession of faith in chapter 17, which is the the chapter on perseverance, it's a wonderful chapter. It's a wonderful just devotional reading. And, And search through the scripture references that are there. But this asserts the doctrine that that all who are genuinely in Christ will certainly infallibly persevere to the end by the grace and power of the Spirit. And the third paragraph, the last paragraph, says this. This is an important thing to know. And though they, this is true believers, those who have been genuinely converted, born again, and have received the Spirit of God, though they may, through the temptation of Satan and of the world, you've heard that, the world and the flesh and the devil. Here, through the temptation of Satan and the world, the prevalency of corruption remaining in them, and the neglect of means of their preservation. 
True believers may fall into grievous sins and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve His Holy Spirit. They come to have their graces and comforts impaired, have their hearts hardened and their consciences wounded, hurt and scandalize others, and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Yet, yet shall they renew their repentance and be preserved through faith in Christ Jesus to the end. Saints, if if you are generally in Christ, he won't let you go. Isn't that what Jesus said? All that the Father has given to me, I will lose how many? Not even one. Not even one. So don't think, well, I might be the exception. In all of human history, I'm going to be that one. No, there's not one. And Judges reminds us of that, doesn't it? Because we look at Judges and go, wow. I mean, we're tempted to boast on the other end. Well, I'm I'm not as bad as Samson. I'm not as bad as fill in the blank. But we do come away with, with the right understanding that if God will deliver even these folks... If God can redeem even depravity to that degree, surely there's hope for me. Surely there's hope for you. So as we study Judges together, may the Spirit of God impress upon your soul the goodness of your God. And I think that's the theme that's important to highlight because it can be lost as we, we, in a sense, wallow in in the depth of depravity of humanity. We might be tempted to forget the goodness of God. But don't read Judges apart from Ruth, for one. Keep that front and center. But let the Spirit of God, invite the Spirit of God, pray the Spirit of God would impress upon your soul the goodness of your God. Whether His goodness is revealed in your deliverance and rescue, or whether His goodness is revealed in the destruction of His enemies, or whether your chastening and discipline that you endure is revealing His goodness and his kindness towards you. Your God is at all times and in every way a good and wise father. A perfect father. So as you uh, go back through and and hopefully on your own read through the book of Judges and prayerfully uh, prepare yourself and your families for for this, this study over the next several months, meditate upon these things. Meditate upon the sinfulness of sin. It's not hard to find the sinfulness of sin in Judges. That's, that's an easy one. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a layout. That's a gimme. But, but, but take the time to meditate upon that and think about it and think about how you think about your own sin. Look at Judges and don't dare think, well, mine could never go there. If you think that, you've missed the point. Meditate upon the sinfulness, the ugliness of sin, the deception of sin. Two, Meditate upon the helplessness of sinners to deliver themselves. This is important for for each of us as believers, but it's also important for us as we think about our family members, our neighbors, our co-workers who know not Christ. The plight that they're in, number one, is worse than they think, the sinfulness of sin, but number two, they can't do anything about it on their own. They need the grace of the gospel. Then thirdly, think about the polluting effect of false worship. Mourn and lament for the nature of worship in, 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 our, in our community, in our nation. The fact that God is worshipped in horrific ways. Just, just this week, it's not in my notes, just this week, it's coming to mind. I, I saw it's a church in North Carolina, an, uh, an evangelical Lutheran church, which is an oxymoronic in so many ways. They have a drag queen coming to lead worship. I mean, celebrating all kinds of perversions and, and, and advertising it as this will lead you into new ways of worshiping God. Do we mourn and lament those things or do we just scoff? Does it break our hearts? Because the polluting effect of, of false worship starts with something small. It didn't start with a drag queen. It started with something else, didn't it? Fourthly, the futility of outward transformation. Again, as you think about your family members, your own children, as you think, I want them to obey, and then it's good. It's, it's right to insist, especially those little ones. They have to obey daddy. They have to obey mommy. 
but no as you pray, that's not enough. Hopefully you're training them to respond to the authority that exists outside of themselves because by nature they want to be their own authority. So you're training them, you're training them, you're training them to listen to mommy's voice, listen to daddy's voice, and recognize there is authority that exists outside of you. And as their understanding grows, you say it is God in heaven who's given mommy this authority. It's God in heaven who's given daddy this authority. And ultimately it's God to whom you must listen. And you cannot fix yourself. You cannot will yourself to stop hitting your brother. You cannot will yourself to stop speaking ill of your sister. And finally, as you read through and you study the book of of Judges, you meditate upon this. Meditate above all things on the goodness of God. Meditate upon his faithfulness, his loving kindness, that he is a covenant-keeping God that does not change. Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we rejoice in the mercy that you show to us. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you even for the hard places in Scripture, things that are hard for us to read, things that, that shock us. But we thank you that you have in your wisdom purposed to shock us. As, as our sensibilities recoil at some of the things we read in your word, may your spirit remind us that we ought to recoil against even the slightest perceived sins in our, we see in ourselves in the same way. That we, we would be every bit as, sh- as repulsed by our own lying tongue, our own lustful eyes, our own deceitful hearts, our, our, our own dishonor of authority than we are by the worst of the sins that we read about in Judges. Lord, will you use these feeble words that I've declared, make them clear, preserve in them what the, the truth that is there, and cast away those things that are unprofitable. Help us to, to search out and see your good and constant and unchanging character. Help us to be more and more conformed to the image of of our King, our beloved Savior in Christ. Amen.